Well, all right. I've got, uh, I've got uh, 6.33, uh, so we're going to try to go ahead and begin. I appreciate you being here uh, in spite of the threatening weather. Barbara and I were just talking about it like it's kind of been that way all for the last couple of weeks, um, but I'm not going to tempt it, so to speak, and say, ha, you haven't been raining on us, and then it become a, a frog strangler outside. But we have made it to Genesis chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28. So I hope that you'll be finding in your Bible. It shouldn't be too hard to find. You look at that first book of the Bible, uh, turn to your right until you get to uh, chapter 28. We're going to look at this. Uh, we may not look at every single verse tonight in chapter 28, even though there's only 22 verses. I really want to kind of hit the highlights. But let's just, by, for way of recap of where we've been uh, for over a year now, uh, I was just thinking today, as I was putting the final touches or finishing touches on this Bible study about where we've been and where we're going, uh, I think about, you know, we started this study uh, in the book of Genesis right before the pandemic. I think it was either late February or early March of last year. We started our journey through the book of Genesis, and now we have made it uh, really just a little bit part of halfway. Uh, we, Genesis obviously has 50 chapters, and I was just thinking, you know, how much longer is it going to take us to get through the book of Genesis? It most definitely will take us through the rest of this year, okay? So it's going to take us uh, maybe quite almost two years to finish the book of Genesis. Remember, we went at a, a, uh, a hurried pace in the beginning in those first two, 12 chapters we covered. Matter of fact, 2,000 years uh, and ready for the entire rest of the Old Testament, we're gonna, it'll take another 2,000 years to go through the rest of the Old Testament. As far as timeline goes, not for you and me, but timeline for what the Scripture teaches us. But here's what I'm ex- I, li- I appreciate about the book of Genesis. Remember, the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. It is uh, giving us um, uh, factual history of how the first humans came into being, how creation came about, uh, that God created uh, it didn't just have a, a, a cataclysmic explosion and then things a, a, appeared. No, no, God spoke it. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth and, and everything that is on the earth, God created? It didn't just evolve or come through the means of evolution. Uh, and so we've covered, think about it, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we saw creation Chapters 3, uh, we saw the fall of man. Remember when we got to chapter 4, we saw the first moral crime ever committed. Do you remember what that was? Murder. Who, was, who killed who? So Cain killed Abel, and Abel was not just another human, on the, on, human being on the face of the earth. He was a blood relative. Okay, so think about this. Think about the significance of that. The first moral crime committed on the face of the earth was one relative killing another, and really, why did he do that? Because he was jealous. That's absolutely right. And so we saw uh, the creation, the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. We saw the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. We saw the first uh, moral sin in Genesis chapter 4. Then you get to Genesis chapter 5, uh, and then you begin to see uh, not only the, the fall of mankind, begin to see the effects of mankind, the, fall, the effects of their fall. Because in Genesis 5, is probably one of the most depressing chapters in all the Bible because what you read over and over again is this thought, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he lived this many years, followed by this little tagline, and he died, and he died, and he died. And so what you have in Genesis chapter 5 is just one great big old graveyard, okay, except one. One person did not die in Genesis chapter 5. Anybody remember that guy's name? Enoch. The Bible says that's right. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Why? Because God took him. Okay, somebody has said, I don't know who to give credit this for. Somebody has uh, uh, said, I think, uh, in, a, in a very positive light, he said, you know, that Enoch walked so close to God that he and God were walking out one day And God says, you know, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Why don't you just come on home with me? And I'm thinking, man, how cool is that to walk that kind of way with God, to have that kind of relationship with God? And so, and then you get into Genesis chapter 6. Anybody know the big event that takes place in Genesis chapter 6 and following? Noah and the ark. That's exactly right. Remember, we were induced to a guy by the name of Methuselah, uh, the oldest person to ever live on the face of the earth. Anybody remember how old he lived? Nine hundred and... 
69 years. Anybody know what his name means? The name of the worst, Bob Blau. Bob is not here tonight. Bob would know this, or at least Amy would tell Bob what it is. So, Bob, if you're watching online tonight, I'm just picking at you. The name Methuselah means this, when he is gone, it will come. You remember we did the math, and so when he was gone, that's when the flood came, okay? So Noah, I think, is the, what is he, the grandson or great-grandson of Methuselah? I forget which it is. Um, and so uh, the flood came when Methuselah died, okay? And so you have Noah and the ark. Uh, the, the, the preacher of righteousness, he built an ark. People made fun of him and thinking, why are you building an ark? Because it's going to rain and asking, what's rain? And what, you know, I don't understand all that. Well, God honored that, and God put those eight people. It was Noah and his wife, or Mrs. Noah, as we often say. And then there was Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, and their, each of their wives. And so there were eight people placed inside the ark, and then you had the flood. And then you come, and that's what you have really through chapters uh, uh, all the way through chapter uh, 11, you have the, the building of the Tower of Babel or attempt to do that, and God causing dispersion, God causing confusion, and separating the dialects of the various people who are on the face of the earth, and you've got all these new people groups. And then you come to Genesis chapter 12, very significant chapter in all the Bible, because this is where God calls Enoch out of his homeland, the, the land of Ur of the Chaldees, and it chooses him of all the people on the face of the earth and develops a, I say develops, gives a covenant with Abraham. And it's through Abraham that an entire nation of people will come that would be a blessing to the rest of the world. And God began that covenant through Abraham. And so Genesis chapter 12, uh, going all the way through Genesis, what, 25? We have basically the life and story of Abraham, and then, uh, uh, so that's a significant part of the book of Genesis, and then we get to chapter, chapter 26 and 27, we were introduced, not necessarily introduced for the first time, we've, we've already uh, been introduced to Isaac, the promised one that God had promised to Abraham and Sarah, but when you get to Isaac, there's just really only a couple of chapters, really just one chapter that just covers him exclusively, Okay. And now you come, now we've gone from Abraham to the brief stint of Isaac. Now we are moving into a new section where the focus primarily is upon a guy by the name of Jacob. Okay, Jacob, he's going to be the one. Remember, he's the younger of the twins. Remember that? But God said when the, there was a struggle inside uh, uh, Rebecca's womb, she said, I don't really understand. You know, I, I'm pregnant. I've got these twins. Uh, there's, a, there's a war. It feels like a war going on inside. And God was saying, here's the reason why the war is going on side, because the elder will serve the younger. And as you know, we saw this last week or a couple of weeks ago where uh, Jacob stole uh, the birthright. He tricked his brother into giving him the birthright. Remember, uh, Esau came in, and he thought that he was starving to death, and, man, I've got to have something to eat. I'm going to die. He said, all right, then give me your birthright. What difference does it make? If I'm going to die starving, then the birthright's not going to mean a, a hill of beans to me, no pun intended. Well, then he realized what he did and thinking, oh, my, what have I done? And not only that, he's about to get the blessing of his father, Isaac, and his mama, Rebecca, steps in, swoops in, and she helps her son to see the father to give him not only the birthright, but also to give him that formal blessing, to, to minister the last will and rights, if you will. And that kind of leads us to where we are here in Genesis chapter 28. And what I want to do is let me read uh, the significant portions of this particular chapter, and then we'll come back and unpack it uh, tonight. And so let's begin in Genesis 28. Are you there yet? Surely by now you're there. Genesis chapter 28. Let me read, uh, oh, the first five verses, and then we'll skip around a little bit. You follow along as I read aloud, because this is very interesting. Now, if you remember the end of chapter 27, uh, Esau is madder than a wet hen, okay? He is really, really upset that Jacob has duped his father into giving him the blessing that he felt like that he deserved, and he's so angry that he is bound and determined to kill his brother Jacob, a lot like uh, Cain and Abel. You'll remember uh, Rebecca, the mother, and again, the father and the mother, they played favorites. Remember that? Uh, and there's never a good thing when you play favorites. And so you had Isaac who played favorites for 
uh, Esau, and then you had Rebekah who played favorites for Jacob. And so she gets wind that Esau is really, really angry and wanting to kill his brother. And so she's going to say, hey, look, hey, you need to go away for a few days. Uh, just go not very far. Go away for a few days. Uh, your brother will cool off, and then we'll come back, and we'll, and we'll have one happy family again. Well, the fact of the matter is I'm not sure that they were, ever were one big happy family. There seems to be this dysfunction, uh, this, this, this problems in this family's life really from the get-go. And remember me telling you last week, when she sent him away, this would be the very last time that she ever, at least from the biblical perspective, the very last time that she ever laid eyes on her son, Jacob. Uh, let's begin now. So that's, that's the background to what we're getting to here in chapter 28. So he is not officially left yet. Uh, but Rebekah's getting ready to send him away. And so verse 46 says, And Rebekah said to Isaac, this is chapter 27, verse 46, just so we can kind of keep up the, the context here. And Rebekah said to Isaac, so now Rebekah is saying to her husband, okay? She's saying to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? And somebody, I don't remember who it was last week, asked a question about this very thing. And I went back and done some more research on this and had completely forgotten about what takes place in Genesis chapter 26, which we will go back to here in a minute. And here's the reason why she makes this statement. And so this is part of the rhyme and reason that she's given an excuse for Jacob to go away because Isaac is unaware of what's going on here. He's unaware that Esau's wanting to kill his brother. And so uh, he's thinking that, you know what, maybe it's good that we send Isaac away, I mean Jacob away, because we don't want him marrying these pagan women. And here's going to give this, here we go, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Now keep in mind, he's already done that, and now he's just kind of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, and watch this, and he charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife. From the daughters of Canaan. Okay, do you think he meant that? Do you think that his mother was adamant about that? Indeed, she was, and we'll explain why in just a moment. Verse 2 Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And then verse 3 we're introduced to a word. Uh, for the very first time, and it says, and may God Almighty bless you. That word God Almighty is the Hebrew word El Shaddai. I'm sure you've heard that word before, El Shaddai. It's the God who satisfies, okay? May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you. And so get the picture. Here's what Isaac is doing. He's, he's passing the torch, if you will. God had made a covenant with uh, Abraham that covenant was passed on not through Ishmael, but Isaac, and now that covenant is being passed on not through Esau, but through Jacob. That's what he's doing. He's passing the baton. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham and to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger. Now watch this, which God gave to Abraham. God's fulfilling the promise that he made. Now keep in mind, the Abrahamic covenant is the covenant that was absolutely and totally unconditional. There was nothing in there that God says, okay, if you do this, I will do that. No, no, no. God is saying, look, I have chosen you, and I am going to do this through you. Okay? You're... Your faithfulness, now obviously God called Abraham to be faithful. God called Isaac to be faithful, although he wasn't all that faithful. God's going to cause a Jacob to be faithful and so on and so forth as you go down through the line and as this new people group comes upon the face of the earth. But the, the real part, the big part of the covenant here was not the faithfulness of those that God made a covenant with, but God himself being faithful to them. Okay? Because here's the one thing that you can bank on. There will be times when you and I are not all that faithful. Get a witness in the house? I'd love to be more faithful than what I am. But here's the thing. There's never a time that God's not faithful. And I thank God for that. And so he says, he's going to give you the blessing of Abraham to give you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So look what happens. 
So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he, sent, and he went to Padam Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. And we'll pick up that in chapter 29. But now, fast forward to verse 10. Okay, let's pick up kind of the theme that's going on here. We'll come back to verses 6 through 9 as we work our way through this text. But just for introduction purposes, let's look now at verse 10. Genesis 28, 10 says, And now Jacob, now watch this, now he's left home. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran, and he came, I find it interesting, the Bible says in verse 11, that he came to a certain place and stayed there for how long? All night, because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, isn't that interesting? He's got a stone or a rock that he's using for a pillow. Now, I wonder how comfortable that was. I submit to you, not very well, what did he do? Verse 12, he does exactly what you and I do from time to time. Then he dreamed, and behold, what is it that he saw? He saw a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top. Now, watch this. Get the imagery here in your mind. I begin to, when I read Scripture, I begin to visualize. At least I try to visualize what it is that I'm reading. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up. And what did it reach from? On the earth, and how far did it go? that's top to heaven, and, and then look what's happening. Get the visual here. Get the picture here. The angels of God, what are they doing? They're going up, they're ascending, and they're coming down. They're descending on what? On it, on the ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac, and the land on which, which you lie, that is where you're laying right now, I will give you and your descendants. And what God is saying here, we'll come back and we'll dig this a little bit deeper in a little bit. God is saying to Jacob through this dream, and God spoke to folks in dreams back in those days. Um, you need to be careful about putting a lot of stock in dreams today because it could be not God speaking. It could be what you had for dinner. Amen? But God is speaking to Jacob in this dream, and he's reaffirming the promise that he made to Abraham, the promise that he made to Jake, Isaac, and now he's making the promise to Abraham. And he says, uh, I will give to your descendants, verse 14, also your descendants shall be, he says, as the dust of the earth, you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. Did he leave any direction out? I didn't think that he did. Um, the west, the north, the east, and the south, that's all of them. And in you, he says, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, the very same promise that he made through Abraham, the very same promise that he made through Isaac. Verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And you will bring and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Again, the, the emphasis here is not on the faithfulness of Jacob, but rather the faithfulness of God. Now look at verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate, underscore that. This is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob arose early in the morning, took the stone that he had, had put uh, at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, uh, but the name of the city has been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house uh, and all, and of all uh, that you give me, and I will surely give you a tenth of it. And you can literally say give a tithe of it. That's what the word tithe means. It means a tenth. Well, with that thought in mind, let's just kind of work our way through this text as we think about what's going on here in Genesis chapter 28. I want to kind of divide this in two major sections. The first 11 verses are what I'm going to call Jacob's problems. Jacob's problems. Now, here's something that ought to be some, of great comfort to you, because it is to me, that even though Jacob 
grew up in what I would call a family of faith or what I would say what we would associate as a Christian home. He was not immune, just like you and I are not immune, from problems. And you say, well, what problems did Jacob have? Well, we've kind of been dealing with it over the last couple of weeks, have we not, about just how dysfunctional this family was, even though this was a family of faith, a family that God was blessing immensely. And going on all the way back, you think about who Jacob's grandfather is. Who's Jacob's grandfather? Abraham. Abraham was, a, was, was called a friend of God. He was the father of the faithful. And so, man, that's kind of hard to live up to when you stop and think about it. I mean, think about it. my granddad. You think about my granddad is in a sports hall of fame? Not literally, not for me. But, you know, I'm just saying people brag about, well, well, I'm related to this athlete or I'm related to that movie star. Jacob was so, well, I'm related to the guy that God included in Hebrews chapter 11, which was God's hall of faith. You think about that, that's, that's are, those are hard, heavy standards to live up to. And so Jacob faced a lot of problems in his life. And let me just kind of mention the two major problems that he had to deal with. Number one, there were, there were problems at home or problems, or home problems, I guess for lack of better ways of putting it, problems at home. And again, this goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 27. If you'll remember, we read... Uh, really, I think it's the end of Genesis uh, uh, 26, really, when you stop and think about it, or is it Genesis 25? Um, actually, Genesis 25, verse 28, uh, it says, Isaac, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, and Rebekah loved Jacob. You had this issue, you had a lot of this trouble and this turmoil can be traced back to the fact that these parents were showing favoritism, Okay. And then from that, it led to the stolen birthright. So you got problems. That now you got friction between you got friction between a mom and a dad because one favors one child over the other. Then you got friction between two brothers because one brother chose to uh, steal the birthright, if you will, or at least deceive the other into selling his birthright. And now you got what we're talking about was we introduced Genesis chapter twenty-eight uh, toward the end of uh, uh, actually toward the end of. Chapter 27, go back to verse, chapter 27, verse 46. If I can stop stumbling over my tongue. Remember, one of the reasons... Now, now Rebecca's wanting to send Jacob away because she's in fear of Esau killing Jacob. But she tells her husband, Isaac, hey, we need to send him away because I don't want him marrying of these pagan women. Now, if you go back, that's when Genesis 27, verse 46, and Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth like these, who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Now, why is she so adamant about this? Why is she so worried about Jacob marrying these girls? Is there a history in the family of this happening? Do your head this way. Go back to chapter 26, and I forgot to bring this up last week. I don't know how I just completely forgot about it. And I think Sam mentioned this. I think Barbara mentioned this. Uh, look at verse 34 and 35 of Genesis chapter 26. Why is she worried about this? Could it be this reason right here? Genesis 26, 34 says, when Esau was 40 years old, boy, these guys get married late in life. When Esau was 40 years old, he took wives, Judith, the daughter of Bereth, the Hittite. Now, he's marrying these pagan, pagan women. And Basimuth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And notice what it says about these daughter-in-laws. So he's already involved in polygamy. Now, again, remind, let me remind you of this. This was not in what I was going to delve into tonight, but I need to remind you of this. Uh, not everything that's recorded in Scripture is condoned in Scripture. Does that make sense? I mean, some people will take this and try to make it a proof test and say, aha, there's proof positive that the Bible talks about polygamy, then it's okay. No, 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 no. It's always been God's design from the very day of creation. One man for one woman for one lifetime. That's, that's the divine plan, okay? We've done a good job of messing that up, okay, all of us. But just because the Bible includes or records areas of polygamy does not mean the Bible condoning that or advocating that. Does that make sense? 
And so I'm grateful that the Bible doesn't try to brush that under the carpet and make us think, oh, no, 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 um, these, these, these Bible heroes of ours, you know, they were squeaky clean. No, no, no. The Bible shows us not only their crowns, but also their warts, okay, uh, just like you and I. We're not all that we think that we are either. So notice what it says in verse 35. It says, and this is chapter 26, verse 35, and they were a grief of mine. Notice this, not only to Isaac, but also to Rebekah. So these daughter-in-laws were almost like, a, she kind of mourned. The Bible talks about it being a grief to the, the mom and the dad of Esau, that these new daughter-in-laws, by the way, these will not be the only two wives of Esau. If you look at the middle part of chapter 28, he's going to marry some more women. Okay? Uh, I don't know why anybody would want that many mother-in-laws. That's beyond me. That's a joke, okay? <laughs> Nobody got it, okay? Um, now y'all are getting it. Y'all are getting it now, okay? So now we come to chapter 28, and Isaac is imploring and encouraging Jacob to move on down the road because he's, he's looking out for what his wife, Rebecca, has just uh, said to him. Again, not only was Rebekah grieving because of what Esau had done, but so was Esau, and he didn't want that to happen to him. Now, let me ask you this. Why does Isaac, not only because it was a grief to Rebekah, but why, why, why do you think he's so adamant about Jacob not marrying these pagan women? You ever thought about that? Why did God want want? his people intermarrying with these, what we would call foreigners, these people who are not God-friendly. That's exactly right. You've got to keep in mind who you're dealing with here, okay? These, these folks were, for lack of a better way, nasty people. Uh, they were nasty in the way that they lived. They were nasty in the way that they interacted. They were nasty in the way that uh, uh, they viewed uh, uh, I hate to use the term religion because I'll be honest with you, when I say the word religion, I want to spit. Uh, Christianity is not a religion. Uh, religion is man's attempt to get to God. Christianity is God's attempt to reach man, okay? God taking the initiative. Uh, and you've got all of these world religions who think that they are uh, preparing man to be accepted in the eyes of God and will never be uh, uh, qualified to be accepted in the eyes of God apart from the Lord Jesus, Amen. And so you think about this, not only the, 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 the spiritual background they have, but you think about this when you move into the New Testament, what's the, what's the admonition and the command in the New Testament as far as Christians and unbelievers and relationships? Yeah, that's exactly what it says. 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it is, it talks about not being unequally yoked. Think about this. Why does the Bible put so much emphasis on not being unequally yoked? And I'll tell you why. It's a whole lot easier to pull down than it is to pull up. I can give you name after name after name of couples who've come to me who were unequally yoked and said, you know what, it, whether it be the man or it be the, 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 the woman who would say, you know what, I know he's not saved or I know she's not saved, but I guarantee you I'm going to marry him or I'm going to marry her, but I, you, Brother Bill, I'm going to be that one example that you'll be able to use as an illustration in years to come. I am going to change that man. I'm going to change that woman. Guess what? I've yet to see one. I haven't seen one. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but I'm just talking about my own personal life. I've yet to see one where it happened, and maybe you can give testimony of that, and I praise God for that. I'm not saying that's an impossibility, but I'm saying it's a very difficult, difficult thing, and I think you know that to be true as well. And so if you've got unmarried kids, you ought to be praying right now for their spouses. Okay? And so, um, notice what he says. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife uh, of the daughters of Canaan. Okay? These, these foreigners, arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And here, again, he's reaffirming the covenant that God had made not only with his dad, that is Abraham, but also now with him and also with his son Jacob. May God Almighty, again, the Hebrew word there is El Shaddai, the God who satisfies, the God who blesses, 
May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessings, a blessing of Abraham that you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Haran to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the, son, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now keep in mind, he's being sent away. Now obviously, we look back at chapter 26, um, Esau was 40 years old when he married. So now we're talking about now Jacob is obviously the same age minus a few seconds or minutes in being born. So they're around the same age. So this very first time that Jacob has left home, and he's a mama's boy. So I'm wondering if he got homesick whatsoever. I remember at my last church, and I'm hoping they're not watching tonight because I'm not going to call them by name. Uh, but I remember this as if it was yesterday. Um, but we had two young kids uh, in our church. Uh, I think one was like uh, in sixth grade, uh, and the other one was like in third grade. It was a boy and a girl, and um, uh, they had never really been away from home. Now, my kids never went through this. My kids never went through this. Um, we put our kids in the nursery, and, man, they were good, okay? Uh, but uh, I, the, the association that I was in at my last church, they required the pastor to go with the kids to children's camp, okay? So I didn't have a choice in it. If the kids were going to go to children's camp, the pastor had to come too. So I would go each year, I think, for 14 years running uh, to kids' camp. Always had a blast with them. But I'll never forget the mama telling me, she said, look, my kids have never been away from home before. Uh, you know, overnight. And so you may have some problems. Oh, we're not going to have any problems. We're not going to have any problems. And we, the, 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 day, the first day went great, no problems whatsoever. But we got to be about 6 o'clock when it started to turn dark. I kid you not, the sixth grader began to hyperventilate about needing to go home. I'll never ever minute I forget it. I mean, I, I was worried about him, okay? I want to go home. I want to go home. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, and we need to get him a hospital or whatever. I mean, he's just really hyperventilating. Uh, any of you had kids like that? You, your kids were that way? Really? Did it work? Yeah. Well, anyway, this kid, I, I, I was very worried about him, so I just finally broke down about midnight and called his mom and dad to come get him, and they, they did. They came and got him, uh, and I felt sorry for them, but they, they warned me. And then I had a couple, a kid and a year or two later that kind of went through the same thing, but he wasn't hyperventilating. He would cry himself to sleep every night, but he made it through the whole week. And, I, I, man, I really praised him. I said, look, I said, man, you made it through the whole week, so you proved to yourself that you can do this, Okay. Anyway, I was just wondering what life was like. You know, again, he's a full-grown adult, and he's, he's obviously in his 40s here. He's the first time away from home. I'm wondering what he's thinking all alone away from mama at that time. Now, go back to verse 6. Let me just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in verse 6 through 9 because uh, I want to get on to the other points. Uh, but verses 6 through 9 tells us that, that Esau was not satisfied uh, or content with the two wives that he had because verse 6 says, And Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badan Aram, to take himself a wife from there, that, he, that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife in the daughter of the, from the daughters of Canaan. And Jacob had obeyed the, his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. But watch this, verse 8, and Esau saw, and that's not easy to say, Esau saw. Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father, Isaac. So Esau, what did he do? He went to Ishmael. And took Maaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. Again, I want to reiterate this one more time, and I promise I'm going to move on. Just because the Bible records it does not mean the Bible condones it. Make sure you understand that. Now we move into not only did he have problems at home, but he also had problems in his heart. Because remember, what does the name Jacob mean? It means deceiver or schemer. So this, and by the way, he lived up to his name very, very well. Now, keep in mind, we have not yet been introduced to Israel. We'll be getting there here in a couple of chapters, okay? So Jacob's name has not been 
transformed or, or changed to Israel yet. He's still that schemer. He's still that deceiver. So that's in his heart, okay? Verse 10 says, And when Jacob went out of Beersheba and went toward Haran, so he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. So we see problems in his heart because now, you know, when you, when you are a deceiver and you've got this consciousness about you, now some people don't have much of a consciousness because I think their consciousness has been seared. But if you have any consciousness at all, what happens when you try to go to sleep? Most of the time, at least for me, when my conscience is eating me alive, I, I can't sleep at all. Matter of fact, I stay awake just thinking about what it is that I've done or in, in some cases what I've not done that I should have done. Not only guilty of the sins of commission, those things that I did, but also the guilties of omission, the things that I should have done that I did not do. Okay? So you had that guilty conscience, so to speak. And so he, plays, he lays his head on a rock, and I can only imagine what a miserable night that must have been for him. But then... Let's move to the next major movement of this particular passage of Scripture. Not only Jacob's problems, but think with me for a little bit about Jacob's picture. Let me tell you something. What I'm going to share with you is Jacob's picture. What did I say? Picture? Not like throwing a ball. Oh, Fisher. Well, I don't always enunciate my words very good, so I appreciate you asking. Picture, like you would see a picture on the wall, a visual, Okay. Well, notice what he does here in verse 12. The Bible says that then he, help me out, then he, okay, I'm going to stay here until everybody says it because you act like you're not paying attention. Then he dreamed much better, much better. How many of you dream almost every night? How many of you don't think like you dream at all? Jill, you don't dream at all? You ever had a dream? Sharon, you're going to tell us one of your dreams? Is that what you're doing? Oh, yeah. I, I had a dream last night. I don't remember much of it. Now, I, I, I don't know how much this is true because it doesn't seem like it's, it's remotely possible. But those who study the subconscious, that's where we dream in our subconscious mind, uh, here's what they said. Uh, and I saw this years and years ago uh, from those who do study on this. Did you know? Th- by the way, does anybody have an idea how long the average dream lasts. Two minutes? Five minutes? Thirty minutes? Are you ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. I still find this hard to believe, but the average dream only lasts 15 seconds. But here's the thing. I find that hard to believe, too. I'm not saying, now, again, I'm not saying that every dream lasts 15 seconds, but the average dream only lasts 15 seconds. Those who've done a study, that's what they say, 15 seconds. There's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. Let me ask you this, and I'm, I'm not going to bog down in this, but have you ever had a dream and either woke up really, really happy or woke up really, really sad because you thought that was the reality in which you were living? I went almost half a day, absolutely in a deep state of depression because I thought I had killed my brother, okay? Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, man, the police are going to come for me. Th- this is just not good. And, and I, I, I'd almost convinced myself that it had really happened because that's what happened in the dream. And then all of a sudden, my brother walks into the house. I'm thinking, you're alive, you know? And so I was afraid to tell anybody. And so it's really weird how you have those dreams no, not at all, not at all, uh, and I'm not proud of that. I mean, just, that's the reason why, you know, I don't know that we're accountable for what we what allow to enter our subconscious mind, but your subconscious mind can do all kinds of numbers on you, okay? So you need to be really careful about putting too much stock into your subconscious mind or in dreams because, I mean, you can have very positive dreams. You can also have very negative dreams. So the Bible tells us that he dreamed. What was it in his dream? Here's the picture. Jacob learned something. Look at this, verse 12. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. Here's what I want you to get. Get, get, get. Jacob learned there is a heaven. Jacob learned there is a heaven. That's what it says here, is it not? 
And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending. So get this visual. You, everybody knows what a ladder looks like, right? So you've got this ladder that is set up on the earth. It's the, the lower part is set up on the earth, and the upper part is extended all the way to heaven. And on this ladder, you've got angels who are descending. They're coming down from heaven, and they're also going back up to heaven from the earth. And the Bible goes on to tell us in this dream that he had or this picture that's being painted for us that he learned that there's a heaven. Now, watch this. Verse uh, 13 says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said... So he's getting a, a theophany here, a, a, a manifestation of God himself, okay? A pre-incarnate manifestation of God. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, that is what you're laying down, I will give to you and your descendants. And here's the promise. Again, he's reaffirming the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God reaffirming the fact that he will be faithful to Jacob in every fact and every, every manner. Now, here's the part that I really want to get you to be blessed by. Now, again, what did he learn in this dream? What did he learn in this picture through this dream that he's having? First of all, he learned that there is a heaven. Now, here's what's really cool about it. Hold your finger there in Genesis 28, and let's go over to the New Testament. Jesus also paints a picture of this imagery here in John's Gospel, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. Are y'all still with me, or have y'all checked out on me? Uh, let's see. Let me begin in verse um, 45, just for context purposes, okay? John chapter 1, verse 45. You there? Say, I'm there. John 1, 45. Here's very important that you see this because uh, I want you to get the context and what Jesus says. And Philip found, now again, this is after the, uh, 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 John the Baptist has declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, and his followers begin to follow Jesus and they're going out and they're taking one and he's picking one. And Philip, the Bible says in verse 45, found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, Nazareth was not a very popular place. When we went to Israel, we got to go to Nazareth. I think you kind of get that. Y'all remember that. And Philip said to him, Come and see. So he's, Philip has gone and recruited a good buddy of his by the name of Nathaniel. Hey, Nathaniel, we have found the one. We have found the Messiah. We have found the one that Moses and the prophets have written about. Hey, come and see. And he goes, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Look at this, verse 47. And Jesus saw Nathan, not Nathan. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Some of your translations may use the word guile there. Verse 48, and Nathaniel said to him, Hey, how do you know me? Well, how is it that Jesus knew who Nathaniel was? Because he's God. He knows everything. And Jesus answered and said, this is going to get really good. Y'all try not to shout now. Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. What a great declaration that is. Verse 50. And Jesus answered and said, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? Is that, is that why you're making that statement? Because I said I saw you? And Jesus goes on to say, Guess what? You're going to see greater things than these. And then look what Jesus says at verse 51. This is, this is really cool. Verse 51. And Jesus said to him, or he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, now watch this. Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, 
you shall see what open? You shall see heaven open, and the angels of God, what are they doing? Upon who? Well, let me ask you something. What's the difference between what Jesus says to Nathaniel and the experience that Jacob had in his dream? What's missing? What's missing? Tara, you're right, and you're right, okay? She's saying Jesus, and you're, somebody else is saying the latter. The reason why Jesus is missing in the story that Jacob had and the latter is missing in the story that Jesus had is because Jesus is the latter. Jesus is the latter. So here's the, here's the second point of sub, sub point. So not only in this picture, this dream, did Jacob learn there is a heaven. Anybody else glad that there's a heaven? Do you believe there's a heaven? You long to go there? Man alive. Almost every night, I'm trying not to get teary out here, before I go to sleep, part of my prayer is, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm just ready for Jesus to wrap up this world. Yes, I've got friends and loved ones who are not saved, and I don't want to see them go to hell. But man, I I'll be honest with you, I'm weary of living in this land, in this world of ours. I'm ready to go to glory, aren't you? Amen. And so I'm grateful for heaven. But here's something else that Jacob learned. Jacob not only learned that there's a heaven, but he also learned there is a way to heaven. John chapter 14, and Jesus is the way. John 14, no doubt you are familiar with verses 1 through 6. John 14, verses 1 through 6 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I'd go and prepare a place for you. I know a lot of people get caught up in the mansions in heaven, and I don't know exactly what they're going to look like. I'll be honest with you, I really don't care. I know this, that anything that Jesus prepares and makes got to be something that I can only imagine. You know, uh, I've heard people say, well, man, I'm going to have me a... a a 16-bedroom uh, mansion in heaven, and man, my grass is going to be immaculate, and da 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 I'm thinking, really? I think that your mansion is going to be the least thing that you are going to take notice of when you get to heaven. But Jesus says that there are, so I believe him. Verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, and where I am, there you may be also. Verse 4, And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas, being that guy, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? And here's what Jesus declared. What does he say in verse 6? Read it with me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus isn't just one of many ways. He is the way. He doesn't just reveal the truth. He is the truth. Jesus doesn't just give life. He is life. If there is to be life to be had, it must be found in Jesus. And so, here's the whole purpose of this dream that he has. He discovers and learns that there is a heaven, but he also learns and discovers that there is a way because he saw the gate. And Jesus is the ladder. To get to heaven, we must go through Jesus. Now, go back to our text. We're going to wrap this up. Has it been worth coming tonight just for that? I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but this is pretty cool when you don't think about it. Well, look what happens. Verse 16, the Bible says, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And he said, I didn't even realize it. And he was afraid. I bet it did kind of freak him out a little bit. But he gets, look at this, how awesome. That's, a, that's an appropriate word. I know some people say, man, we, the word awesome is overused. But I think when you think about heaven, heaven is awesome with a capital A. How awesome is this place? There is none, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put at his head and set up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. The word Bethel literally means house of God. But the name of the city that had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, 
so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And by the way, God's going to keep that end of his promise. In verse 22, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, he says, I will give you a tenth. I will literally give you a tithe of it. So whatever it is that God has blessed us with, I think, and I'm not trying to preach on giving tonight, but we are to give that portion back to God as a token of worship. Amen? Questions or comments? Yeah, have you, I was thinking about this today. As a matter of fact, I had to go YouTube it. You know, there's a song called We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. I remember the first time I heard it, I'm going old school on y'all, okay? I don't know if he's the first one to sing it, but it's the first time I heard it. It was in a Billy Graham televised um, crusade, and it was George Beverly Shea. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? And so I challenge you tonight, go YouTube George Beverly Shea singing uh, Jacob's Ladder. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder, and, and I'm not going to sing it to you because I'd empty this place in a hurry. Uh, but it simply goes like something like this, the words, We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. O ye soldiers of the cross. And then the next verse, it talks about the rungs of the ladder and things like that. But why? Because we are climbing on Jesus. Because Jesus is the way. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. Jesus is the way to heaven. And all of God's people said, I challenge you to do that. I think you'll be blessed. George Beverly Shea, I mean, if I had a CD of him, I would wear that thing out. I love hearing George Beverly Shea and Cliff Barrow sing in the Billy Graham's Crusade. So those of you not old enough to remember that, uh, man, you missed out. Uh, but good news, there's YouTube. Any other call, thoughts or comments? Luz, yeah. Seems to be. Uh, e- either he was on the outskirts of the city, but he was he, he was part of a community or part of a place that was called Luz. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know that he was any he was anywhere where he was under the street lights or anything like that, you know. But uh, he 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 was definitely out there. I just wonder what it was like for him that night. You know, you think about this dream. What a glorious dream this is to, to get this vision from God. And God used it to reaffirm the covenant that he would establish with Abraham that would also continue through him and being, being blessed by that. Uh, you know, because the Bible says he, he originally when he woke up, he was afraid. And then he thought, oh, my, there's something to this dream. Okay? Uh, and indeed it was. He got a vision that there is a heaven uh, and there's also a way to get there. Let me rephrase that. There is the way to get there. I don't know that, but I'm just thinking about that, yeah. Indeed, indeed. You know, it's always good to get away, but then you, then you, the, the, the longer you stay away, the more you begin to, to miss home in the in the things that you enjoy. Yeah. I think I think that's part of it too. I don't know if you heard what Jewel said. Are we still recording? I was talking about, you know, wondered if, you know, because he was not walking with the Lord and not living uh, for the Lord and, and because of his lifestyle of being a deceiver, a schemer, um, could it be that God was speaking to him, look, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to fulfill the promise uh, that I've given to you. And I think that's part of it, absolutely. Anybody else? Could be, uh, and I and, and and I want to make very clear what I what I said earlier, and I think I've said this in maybe a sermon or two uh, since I've been your pastor. I'm not saying 
that God can't speak through dreams. I'm not, don't, please don't go over here. Oh, Brother Bill, he's off, he's off his rocker. He just said that God can't speak through God can do anything he chooses to do. If God wants to speak through a dream, he absolutely can. But what I am saying to you, according to the book of Hebrews, that's not the primary way that God speaks. And I will tell you this, if you ever have a dream and you think it's from God and it doesn't line up with this book, it ain't from God, okay? It may be that bad pizza you had the night before, okay? Because God's not going to say anything that is in contrary to this word. That's one thing. You know, if God's reaffirming something in his word, it could very well be from God. So please don't leave here saying, well, Brother Bill don't believe in dreams. I, I'm not saying God, God does. I'm not saying doesn't. God can do whatever he chooses. But I know this, everything that God does lines up with what he said in this word. Right, right. Have you, um, you ever been either laying on your bed or sitting in your recliner or even driving down the road, and all of a sudden a thought will pop into your mind that you hadn't thought of in years? I had this, this, I had this just the other day, okay? I remember this like it was yesterday. Uh, I remember when I was four years old. My, I got my first cowboy boots when I was four years old, and I remember this about me and why I did it. I have no idea, but I would put my cowboy boots on the wrong foot, okay? I put the right on the left, the left on the right, and I remember mom would always get, Bill, what are you doing, you know, da 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 and she would put them, take them off, put them on my right foot, put it on my left foot, and Sometime during the day, I'd pull them back off, and I'd put it on my left foot, and I'd put it on my right foot, and so I'd always put the wrong boot on. And I hadn't thought about that in years. And just a few months ago, it popped back in my head. I'm thinking, man, where, where in the world did that come from? Getting back to research of those who study the mind, they say that 95% of everything that you and I experience, we see, we hear, we read, is stored in the subconscious mind and is capable of coming up at any moment. And that's the reason why we've got to practice what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says. You know what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says? Verse 3, 4, and 5, I think it is, 2 Corinthians 10, 3, 4, and 5, it says that we need to be, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and that we're to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So you've got to be very careful that your subconscious does not dominate you because that part is not completely renewed, okay? So you've got to be real careful about the subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind can cause you to have ulcers and make you worry because your subconscious mind will speak to you things that are absolutely not true. Okay? Cause you to believe things that are absolutely not true simply because you've experienced it, you've, you've read it, you've heard it, or somebody has said it to you. Uh, if you're not careful, it will eat you alive. Absolutely. Through that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else? Let me give you, okay, we're done. Uh, thank you all for that.